So now we move to the inspirational lesson of our service. And I wanna invite uh, Monty Cameron to join me. She's a religious science practitioner, has been with our community for uh, a very long time um, and has continued her spiritual growth uh, and learning uh, through a lot of metaphysical practice and um, expression. She's a teacher um, and I'm so delighted, Monty, that you joined me today. Thank you for uh, allowing this expression to happen together. Appreciate that. I want to just set context and then I'll allow uh, Monty to kick us off a little bit. Uh, so this month, the, the book of the month is the book of joy. It is written by the Dalai Lama and uh, the Archbishop Desmond Tutu. So of course, a Christian and a Buddhist, which makes it perfect for our expression because in the science of mind, we know that there are multiple truths the truths that come together regardless of the perspectives that they're brought forth, whether it's from a Christian perspective or from a Buddhist perspective. And the Dalai Lama and uh, uh, Desmond Tutu do a wonderful job. They have a great relationship and that is expressed in the book through humor, uh, through how they connect and how they see the truth together and weave uh, the quilt. And so the Book of Joy is a part of the discussion of how do we use science of mind during this pandemic. I also wanna mention that our theme of the month is simplicity. And I think the pandemic has probably caused all of us perhaps to move into a more simplistic life as we stay home more than um, before. So that's a little bit of context. Monty, maybe you wanna help uh, prop up now uh, a little bit about our discussion today. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. I um, uh, I totally enjoyed the book, the the Book of Joy. I think it was very refreshing, and like you said, it brought about the whole spectrum of of the believers um, in the world, and and even they he brought in something about the non-believers. So so finding joy is something that every religion in the planet has to do with a connection, with a spiritual connection, with a, um, with a deeper connection inward. And they also um, said that that is not necessarily defined to any one particular religion. Humanity, basically. Yes, I love that part. And they continue to come back to it's all about humanity, not all the creed and the, and the uh, Dharma or the processes, but rather uh, being human, having this uh, human experience, being a spiritual being, regardless of how uh, you live that, express that, know that. And I know that, um, uh, of course, this book was written long before COVID. Uh, and yet at the same time, the Dalai Lama and uh, Desmond Tutu uh, continue to speak to, yes, as humans, we do all suffer. And they talked a lot about, while we may look at the expressions of the world, and especially if you're watching the news, where it may feel like that is all there is, but there is actually more if we are willing to look beyond the visible and or to see that there's always two sides of the coin. I always like to use that metaphor, heads and tails, meaning what do you choose to focus on? And that's appropriate for this time during COVID, is it not? Absolutely, absolutely. We, we tend to have a kind of a mental myopia, myopia of where we are, whatever our experience are, is around us. And uh, a lot of times that brings fear and it brings suffering and it brings loneliness when you're, when you're forced into being alone a lot. Um, your, your mental, uh, the way you look at it and, and uh, your mental thoughts around that are going to be your experience. So, so um, this book actually talked a lot about uh, broadening that, widening that perspective. And a lot of times as we, as we widen that perspective, 
And I found in my life, this is always true. If you take it to a bigger picture, if you take it to a wider perspective, then everything comes into balance. You understand more, you have more compassion, there's more unity, um, there's more love shared with each other. And, and then all of a sudden you have that fear and that suffering is not quite as, as, uh, as large as it used to be. And I know mo emotions are hard to get through, that sometimes they're really hard to change, but um, perception is not so hard. So perception is one of the things that we actually can look at and change, have the power to change our mind. And as we perceive differently, then our emotions start to come back together. Yeah, matter of fact, uh, this was a really unique expression of um, how important it was, even when you're suffering, yes, you must take care of yourself, but, but the book spoke specifically about if you then move yourself into compassion, understanding that other human beings are also suffering, that by expanding, as you said, that breadth and that depth of understanding that we're all human, that we, and, and not to diminish what you're going through, but to understand that you are one with all humans who express and who uh, suffer. And by broadening that and connecting with other uh, people's um, experience of suffering, that, com that compassion actually expands your heart and expands your mind into, as you said, a better balance between it's not just tunnel vision, but understanding our connection more broadly. Yeah, yeah, very, very good. Very um, good. So grow your compassion is one of the lines that I uh, wrote down. It's not that I don't see myself as a compassionate being, but as they spoke to realizing that as people are in their um, suffering, how can we bring union into that suffering as far as from a compassionate heart? Now, I wanted to bring up many people, of course, are familiar with the loving kindness meditation. And that meditation um, is actually, uh, I'm teaching the practitioner interns, and we actually uh, used that meditation. And that meditation has been shown, they've actually done some uh, experiments and um, some research on as individuals for just two weeks, practice the loving kindness meditation, they can measure the change in people's brains and realize that it lifts them uh, that I thought that was amazing. Do you remember them talking about that? Yeah, no, I don't remember. And I'm not familiar with the loving kindness meditation, but okay. But so I let me, I'm sitting here going, I know I printed it out, but now of course it's not with me. So I, what did I do with it? Uh, it is the meditation that I know that you have heard before. Here it is. That is, may I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be happy. And then it moves to may he or she, as we surround a friend, a family member, or even somebody who we're having difficulty with, may he or she be filled with loving kindness. May he or she be well. And then lastly, may all beings be filled with loving kindness. And I thought the fact that that um, experiment of asking people to do this for two weeks and actually being able to see the difference says something about science of mind. It's what you're focusing on. Where is the reality with a capital R as in truth and focusing on that truth. Yeah, this meditation um, does that. absolutely. And I do think that, that um, just listening to you read that, it puts us into a self, respect, a self um, reflection about ourselves. And I know um, for me, I think, I think the way that we do connect with other people is the way we connect with ourselves. So I think one of the things that the COVID has brought to us is our ability to stop our busy lives, stop 
what we are. We're not defined by a regiment that we do every day. So as that changes, it, we look at how can we do things different? And it has forced many of us into more of a time when we can self-reflect and through um, meditation or, or whatever it is where you're just sitting and connecting with something deeper within yourself. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, a lot of people say connecting with the God within the higher power. And, and I, I think it's just a connection that and connecting deeply. And as you connect deeply, it, it, um, it allows you to see others, to see, to connect with others. Um, there, is, there is nothing in this world that's independent. I mean, we are all connected. And so as we, as we connect within, we find out that there is that wholeness, that there's everything that we need right there which is the same for all people. And, and I, we can't really connect with other people until we connect with ourselves. That's beautiful. And uh, I, I want to go back to, I've had a um, couple colleagues say, oh, I can't do meditation. And I want to say then with that beautiful song that these um, high schoolers uh, created and saying, then sit with that. Because I, I, I don't know how you can't open your heart, even just sitting with that song and therefore connecting with yourself, even if it's through music. In other words, spiritual practice comes in many forms. The opportunity with the song is to sit with that, to have your heart open and to then connect with yourself um, from that domain rather than constantly being in our head or constantly expecting the outside world to bring us the peace and joy that we can actually find sometimes with just sitting with the song. Yeah, yeah, wasn't that lovely? I, yeah. it's, uh, it just, it said it all. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and I wanted to lean into what you said about, uh, you know, what have we learned during COVID? Oh, okay. Well, um, you know, people may not like what's changed, but we've all had to deal with lots of change, whether that's wearing a mask, how we go to the store, uh, how much we're staying home versus out, I don't know, shopping or doing other events and activities. And while I realize, you know, for those that like to go to concerts or even in our, in our um, community, love to come together at the center so that we can love and exchange hugs and, and be with one another, um, there has been a sense of understanding about change. And um, uh, we have the saying, you know, change your thinking, change your life. And I, I wanted to speak specifically about um, it has caused perhaps our mental habits to be more accentuated, which may cause more suffering, or it may have caused our mental habit, uh, habits to need to change. So talk a little bit about, because the book talks about mental immunity. What did you get out of that part? Oh, the mental immunity. I like that part of the book because it really, it, it equated it to the same as our our physical immunity, like when we, if we keep our bodies healthy, if we eat right, if we um, get enough sleep, whenever there are viruses or bacteria or something, we have immunity to fight those off. So, um, so mental immunity is the same thing. It's choose your thoughts, choose, it's, it's, pretty much what we were talking about earlier about what is your perception? What are your thoughts? And if your thoughts are uh, based on what's going on with, with you individually, solely alone on a day-to-day -day basis, then what is the good about that? What is there? There is good in the world that can come about it. And I, I think COVID has, um, you talked about what have we learned? And, and I think we've learned a lot about, not only about ourselves that we can choose differently, but we've learned about how to take care of the planet and how we, how we live with the planet. I, I think um, uh, we already knew it mentally, you know, we have to slow down the, 
the, all of the carbon emissions and, and, but the ability to do that is, is we now learn that we can do it. We can do it and we're okay. And I don't think we'll ever go back to where we were. So no. I no. think we've been stretched. There's no going back, yeah. although there may be some things that change, you know, change once yes. again, but yes. Yes. I think also when the COVID first came out in March, one of the things I said is it has practically taught everybody that we are one when our breath, as we know now, we didn't know as much in March, when our breath is inhaled and exhaled with each other, it has mm -hmm. demonstrated the reality of our oneness in the physical. Mm -hmm. Yes, I like that. I like that perception, Kathy, a lot. And one of the things that has just amazed me and awed me is this is really the first, um, first thing that this planet has done where the whole planet is affected wow. on the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I do think it's not a mistake. I do think as a planet, we are yearning to connect. We are yearning to um, and, and with not knowing how, I think the universe shows us how. And I know I read something not long ago where um, the millennial, the millennials and the Gen Z are the loneliest um, groups of generations that have come together mm -hmm. yet so far. Wow. And so... Um, so I, I think it's uh, I think it's time. I think I think it's very timely, and it's. So you're basically, you're basically saying the pandemic is a calling, and many times we want to judge, mm -hmm. judge the pandemic, judge COVID, mm -hmm. but what it has done, as you were saying, maybe created a common enemy for all of us as the world to now come together. Uh, to uh, determine how we can work together to overcome this, regardless of how that happens. It's all God, whether it's a vaccine or some other form, but yeah. it is a calling to the whole world. And, you know, we weren't so globally connected as we have been since the internet. And of course, the internet is not everywhere. And that has also been raised as a very visible, the haves versus the have nots. I know in education, we're talking about that a lot, even from a state and federal level, how do we get the internet available to everybody? Why? Because that's how we're connecting. And, and so there are things that have come out of COVID during this time that are causing shining lights over here. We can do this. We're gonna work on this together and brings Absolutely. about new um, intentions, yes? Absolutely. And it absolutely brings out those, uh, those feelings of compassion and loving kindness, and how can we how can we do this together? How can we connect? Yeah, um, I have uh, the book called How to Use Science of Mind. Again, this is a, a part of the practitioner uh, training. So any practitioner has, of course, read this book. Mine is a very old version. In it, it's um, I, I want to start with that uh, Ernest Holmes has said that a trained mind is much more powerful than an untrained mind. Now, a lot of people don't like to hear the word discipline, but you know, if we, if, if, um, I wanna be careful about this, but as we're a kid, uh, we tend to follow our emotions heavily. And as we grow up, we have to learn to deal with those emotions and um, uh, work through for ourselves through those emotions to do what is right for us to do. And in uh, page 20, it says, in metaphysical practice, we arrive at this conviction through a process of thinking. The process itself is not the conviction, it's the road that leads to it. To the average individual, this process is necessary. And what it's really talking about here is our affirmative prayer, which we call science of mind treatment, uh, actually moves us from where we may be in perhaps looking at a worldly uh, situation and moving us back to what we call first cause. In other words, what's reality with a capital R? Truth is love, peace, power, beauty, joy, life their wisdom, harmony. And we use this process to move 
our thinking to an understanding, as we were talking, the more um, the broader perspective, and then allow ourselves in that science of mind treatment to move towards the conviction of the intention of I'm going to live the greater truth, the reality uh, of knowing that there is love, of knowing that we are one, of knowing that we're connected, that we suffer together. And I'm going to continue to use um, as those students did uh, when they were in the in the song where they said, uh, we're stronger than the distance between us and we are not together, but we are not alone. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And that yes. bringing us together with, uh, you know, what, what Ernest Holmes brought to us is you're right, a unity, we are all, we have everything we need. Um, and again, I will go back to that connection is made to our oneness and to our wholeness through connecting deeply, connecting deeply within. Yes. And it, isn't it interesting that our theme for this year was deepening our spiritual connection? <laughs> <laughs> and so people have a choice, meaning... Uh, again, the majority of us are spending more time at home. We have a choice to do some form of a spiritual practice to yes. continue to remind ourselves and to change our habits of thinking uh, in understanding, again, the connection to our spiritual nature, connection uh -huh. to accepting the suffering we may be going through, not trying to push it away, accepting it, but then again, broadening it to a broader truth and knowing that we are in this together. Yeah. Yeah, very good. All right. Uh, maybe just a couple more things here. Um, I, you know, I'm sort of curious when we come together after the service, I will love to hear what uh, the community feels like they're learning from COVID. Certainly uh, when we started in March, what we thought we learned, we may have been in shock. Certainly now being how many months later, six months later, um, what have we learned now? Sometimes looking in hindsight, uh, we get that broader uh, perspective because we're looking over a broader period of time and being able to share with one another, uh, maybe as you said, what's probably not going to change back. In other words, what are the things that uh, perhaps um, if there's more of a spiritual practice that's been developed or other habits that help us create our physical, mental, spiritual uh, immunity that perhaps that's what's gonna stick with us going forward. So what would you say, Monty, for you personally, are there things that you feel like you've learned and this is what I see going forward? Well, um, I haven't learned any new skills like knitting or, <laughs> or how to play the ukulele. I bought a ukulele and was gonna learn how to play the ukulele. Love it. And I know that many are, many people are just picking up on all kinds of skills. Um, I, you know what I would say for me, probably the most, the biggest advantage that I have received out of this is the ability to, I have a grandson living with me. And so the ability to do meditation on a daily basis with a 14 year old um, and introduce him to meditation and that will stick with him for the rest of the life, I think, I think is the biggest advantage for, for me that's come out of this. Wow. So I supported my daughter in learning transcendental meditation. Mm, it, uh -huh. Very similar to what you're saying as she uh -huh. prepares to go into physician's assistant school, which of course, you know, a very stressful uh, yeah. educational experience. Yeah. And, um, and based on so many things going on. Uh, so I'm going to take that now to the broader perspective, bringing others into the understanding of mindfulness, if you're not necessarily deeply spiritual, or into the understanding of this connecting um, within, going deeper, uh, sharing that, because we know that the next generation, that climate change isn't going to change just like that. And therefore, there is more that what they will continue to be exposed to. And uh, wow, that's a fun intertwining that I didn't know we had, but I love that. <laughs> 
That's great. Yes, and I do know that mindfulness is springing up everywhere. I mean, it's just, uh, it's becoming mainstream, which just tickles me. I, I know, um, uh, speaking of my 14 year old grandson, um, he's had uh, physical, his, his main doctor, and he's had uh, different professionals in the medical field that have suggested mindfulness as a way of life. So um, we would not have heard of that a few years ago, having the medical field say, let's, let's, let's put some mindfulness in there. <laughs> so it is a changing uh, world. <laughs> it is a changing world. It is a changing world. Beautiful. Yes. Well, any, any uh, summary or wrap up uh, you would like to bring into the conversation? Well, Kathy, this has been delightful. It's been a delightful discussion. And I, I do think these are very interesting times. And I do think, um, I think we can learn a lot from them, which we already have, but I think there's going to be a huge amount that we have learned that will, that will go forward and, and uh, continue for many, many years. And, and I think um, one, of, one of the biggest things we learn, we learn is that we need each other. We need each other because we are each other. And as long as we do our um, spiritual practices or, or mental practices, as far as what is my perception, I think we're all gonna come out um, to be better. Beautiful. And I'm going to end with something that was by Dr. Ernest Holmes. Most of you know that he died, I think it was around 1960. And um, so you may hear this paragraph and think he was talking about today. Um, but it was actually uh, previously that he wrote this. And I just think it sums it up similar to what you said, Monty. The world is perhaps at the point of the greatest crisis in all human history. And there seem to be two attitudes we can assume. One is calmness, faith, and conviction, and the other would be despair. And despair is unthinkable. Let each in their own way dedicate their time, their service, their hope, and their spiritual conviction to the common cause of liberty and justice for all. And let's work together without, ty without tiring and pray without ceasing. And so it is very wonderful. And so it is. Thank you so much, Monty. I appreciate your uh, adventurous uh, willingness to join me. And it was a wonderful uh, experience. Thank you so much. Great conversation. Thank you. Thank you.